I mean, you could have an unlimited number yeah, of fathers, one. essentially. Hey, folks, it's Nick in the studio with Carl Binger, Paris Natural Farms, Randy Cummings, Bootstrap Farmer, Drew Medford, Growing for Market Magazine, and in the corner without a mic, Gary. All right, so the topic for the day is the title of this is going to be GMO versus hybrid seeds. And the GMO bit is just going to basically be going here is the definition of GMO seeds, but primarily we're going to be talking about hybrid seeds. And the purpose is to give farmers enough knowledge to whenever you're selling your items and the inevitable question comes up about are these GMOs, to be able to give a very precise, correct answer so we are not contributing to the nonsense of misinformation about where seeds come from. So the reason I wanted to save this for today, Andrew, I'm not even going to put words in my own mouth and get this wrong. You were part of the Johnny Selective Seeds trial farm for quite some time, very much around this. Randy, as a sales rep, I think you're uh, involved in a lot of training that would help us navigate this. Carl, you're representing all the farmers out there. Gary, if you have something to say, we'll pull the mic up to you, and then I'm going to keep the train moving. So without any further ado, Andrew, can you give us a little bit of background as to what qualifies you to talk about hybrid seeds? I'm laughing because... Yeah, I worked in the seed industry for seven years at, at Johnny Selected Seeds. And so I definitely, you know, knew a little bit about seeds going in. And I, I learned a lot just over the over the course of being there about how seeds are bred and developed and that whole process. Randy, a lot of training came your way, I would imagine. Yeah, I was at Johnny's for 11 years. Folks like Andrew would do coordinate trials on like, let's say, 350 varieties of tomato. And we'd go out and help walk the trials and, and explain what our, the traits our customers were looking for um, that would help Andrew make the assessment so that he could curate the varieties in the catalog. So when we talk about traits, it might be flavor. It might be uh, we're really looking for a pink tomato. It might be late blight was really bad this year, so growers are looking for late blight resistance, you know things like that and that may steer the direction on what great folks like Andrew would do in reaching out to all these different seed breeding organizations and find out what can you send me for late blight resistant tomatoes or what do you have in your pink offerings uh so on where i want to go is let's go ahead and define a gmo seed so we can get that out of the way and put that to bed and then we're going to focus on the hybrid seeds. And as this podcast goes on, I want to give farmers an idea of what all it takes to actually get seeds in hand on the farm. If we're going to talk about food transparency and where food comes from and the consumers buying end of it, I think it's equally important for farmers to understand the complexity that it takes to get quality seeds in the hands of the right growers. So I'm going to read this off to the B reel that looks like the world is ending. GMO seeds, lab created with biotechnology techniques like gene splicing to alter the seed genetic makeup, can include adding, muting, and changing existing genes to create plants with genetic traits. Examples include pest resistance, weather tolerant, or to be able to withstand herbicides. A little note, can contain genes, genes from different species, which is not true of hybrid grown and subject to rigorous testing due to environmental and health impacts. Is there anything off about that statement or that you two would like to add? It's the definition of GMO seed. We are not going to debate whether that is, I don't even want to get into it because we're not talking about it. But basically, I think it's important to point out, are there GMO lettuce seeds? We can we can talk a, a little bit about this, right? So let's just to maybe help people understand the the perception is GMO seeds are everywhere and sure. they're easily got, but they're not. So let it, it, let let's talk about that for a yeah, second. Yeah, I think I think that's a real scary headline, but when we start kind of digging in, um, and so 
maybe let me share just a, a tidbit that I think will help frame the conversation, right? So if we look at it in the terms of like the human genome project, right? Scientists have been able to look at human DNA and put all these individual traits and and map them. And they say, okay, if, if we're looking at all these different codes of proteins and aminos and, and so on and so forth, and that's two miles long of coding, scientists are at that point where they can say, this string of code gives someone blue eyes. This string of code gives someone, you know, blonde hair. We're getting to the point where they can do that with vegetables and, and the, the DNA of that as well. I think that kind of frames some of this and being able to say, okay, if this vegetable, this is the, the piece of DNA that gives it its flavor. Or here's... If we take these five tomatoes with late blight resistance, all of their code in this section is the same. We're going to guess that this part of the code is late blight resistance. And that's kind of the simplest way to kind of just frame it, right? We're talking about things like lettuce. Up until this point, there really hasn't been any research on genetically modified lettuce. No one has identified anywhere in that string of DNA that this gives that lettuce powdery mildew resistance. There are no markers. So there can't really be any GMO breeding without the blueprint on the code and what, right? There is no markers to identify or flag and say, Ah, that's a GMO gene. Like there is in some crops that have been bred that way. Sweet corn, soybeans, alfalfa. There might be more uh, sugar beets. A lot of times we're talking big commodity crops that are used for fillers and, and animal feed and things like that. It's your average vegetable, no work has been done in in that kind of regard. I think the, the one of the crops that kind of spans that like human consumption side, there's been a little bit of work in in zucchini for some very specific disease resistances. But these other monocrop, commodity crop, row crops seems to be mostly for resistance to herbicides and, and Roundup Ready. And so let's, let's use the zucchini example. Sure. If a farmer chose to use a GMO zucchini seed, what steps are going to be in place for him to buy that seed, and how difficult is it actually actually put this in practice? Typically, they'd have to sign a waiver. And because that that those genetics are are the property of a company. The the concern for big bad evil seed company is that someone would save that seed and multiply it out and sell it to Carl and Andrew and Carrie and and they've lost their investment because this 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 breeding work isn't cheap or inexpensive to do right. So before anyone would sell you Nick Burton. GMO zucchini seed, they would need you to sign, you know, an, an affidavit that you wouldn't save seed, multiply seed, sell it to your friends at a profit. And by the way, you're not buying a package or even a pound. Mm. You're buying a lot of seed. You're not even on that seed company's or breeding program's radar at all. So from a market gar gardening standpoint, and if you haven't picked up or heard of the Greenhouse and Hoop House Growers Handbook by Andrew, I, I like, well, I don't like, it's my favorite thing about the book, is you have named eight crops that are the backbone of market gardening, which are tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, cucumbers, microgreens, leafy greens, herbs, and lettuce. 
none of these are even available in GMO. So from a customer's perspective, let's talk about, are we done talking about GMOs? I mean, I, it, because, because it's just not available to market. Sure. Gardener. I think, I think there's one other point to maybe throw out there that often gets lost in the marketing, right? Right. Um, in a previous podcast, we talked about adjectives that farmers use, you know, organic, pesticide free, free range, you know, these adjectives on on the crops or, or what they bring to market. And it's no different for, for seeds. You'll see some seed companies that market their their seeds as organic, non-GMO. And I think it's helpful to realize those terms are are also overlap. And by definition, a organic seed cannot be GMO. It, it won't. An organic certifier will not certify that seed crop. So it's a kind of a, a not every non GMO seed is organic, but every organic seed by definition is non GMO. So it's a, it's a, it's a redundant statement. So if you're, if it's important to you, that you're not supporting genetically modified, you know, seeds. You don't have to specifically look for that disclaimer that says non-GMO. If you shop that organic label, you know you can shop safe, period. I like it. I like it. The thing that I think confuses people, and the reason I wanted to do this one so bad is I had two experts here, but secondly, I see the word hybrid get thrown out on discussion groups and in various places, and people automatically assume that hybrid equals GMO. But it's such a, a different process, and I don't think farmers have gone down the rabbit hole enough to know what a unique and special process this is to get this to market. So let me read the definition to hybrid seeds. We'll, we'll <clears throat> cue the uh, non-disastrous be real here. Hybrid seeds created through traditional crossbreeding where pollen from one plant is used to fertilize another. Parent plants are chosen for specific traits, such as disease resistance, higher yields, taste with offspring, which is the hybrid seed, exhibit those traits. This process happens naturally in nature, with commercial ag is done in controlled settings to ensure desired outcomes, and this is at plant breeders. And the second generation is inconsistent and may not inherit those traits. Are we fi- are we good with that definition, or do we want to add or take away or amend that? I, I'm I'm good with that definition. Mm-hmm. I think okay. the, the problem is just there's there's so much confusion. Right. Well, that's that's why we're here. We're going to eliminate all this confusion. Yeah, that's, that's the, why this conversation is worth happening. Ha- worth. This is why this conversation is worth having because there's so much confusion between between the the different terms out there. Okay. So let's talk about the advantages of hybrid seeds and why you might want to even think about looking at it. And we're going to get into how this has developed later on. So if somebody were to call any seed company that has greenhouse varieties in stock and they were, they said something to the effect of, cause I've heard this, well, these things are a dollar a seed and I can mm-hmm. get 10 cent seeds with this variety over here. Why should I, why should I get this? I, I think Andrew can probably explain much better than I can that, but but let me set it up a, a little bit as well, right? Just like breeds of dogs, you know, you've got a pit bull, you've got a, a pug. They all have different personalities. They all have different fur, you know, different sizes and whatnot. Um, some were bred as hunters. Or, or uh, you know, hunting dogs. Some were bred as companions. Some were bred as guard dogs. So, when we're looking at it from that lens, even a, a tomato can't be good at everything. It can't taste great, and yield great, and be disease resistant, and be the perfect color, and uh, you know, have the the ease of harvest plant habit. And so you're going to have to make a decision on what characteristics are you chasing for the environment or your market that you're going to put this in. And so that I think is a good basis to kind of start the conversation. Right. But, 
I don't know if you want to kind of take it from there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good direction to go in. In fact, I'd like to even back it up just one frame behind and just talk about... I'm going to give you the keys to the ship on this one. You're way more qualified to talk about this than I am, so start wherever you like. Okay. All right. Because I, I know I know there's so much confusion. In fact, the first the first job that I did in the seed industry was just was taking taking orders. And I, I heard people say, you know, I don't want any of those genetically modified hybrids. And, you know, there could be both things, but people what people were doing is they were conf- confusing hybrid seeds and genetically modified seeds. And so I mean, another another term that would be useful to throw out there is an open pollinated variety. Okay, and so that's like, like let's say brandy wine. Like a, a brandy wine is a tomato. A lot of people are familiar with, right? If you grow brandy wine and don't let it get cross pollinated with any other varieties, like if you have a, a garden, all you have is brandy wine in there. The only tomato pollen flying around is brandy wine, and you harvest those seeds, you're going to get another brandy wine, right? So that's op- open pollinated are basically varieties that are stable, and will you know will breed true and the problem is when people confuse being hybrid with being genetically modified because being hybrid is completely natural okay Hy- hybrid is the birds and the bees right so hybrid is when let's say you have a a brandywine tomato and then you have another like another old heirloom like great white a white tomato the bee goes and visits great white and then goes over and visits Brandywine. And then the, 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 if you save the seeds from the Brandywine after it got visited by the bee that had just visited the Great White, you'll have a hybrid. So hybrids happen all the time in nature. That's what, that's what people uh, have to understand, is that hybrid is in, in no way unnatural. It happens all the time. It's I mean, likely happening in your garden right now if you have OP, open pollination. Right. I mean, a hybrid is like, is to go back to the dog analogy, that's if, if you have a, a, you know, a female dachshund and a male schnauzer and they get together, like the offspring is not going to look exactly like a dachshund or a schnauzer. The offspring is a, is a hy- hybrid. It's an obnoxious mutt. <laughs> it's an obnoxious mutt. And so hybrids happen all the time. Hybrids happen like without anybody doing anything. You just get the right bee to visit, you know, two, di- two different types of, of tomatoes and you can get a hybrid so there's nothing there's nothing unnatural about that you know the difference is genetic modification happens when somebody takes a gene outside of the normal process of breeding you know using pollen introduced to a, to a flower ovary right because People, it typically happens when people want to, in, to introduce a trait, like, get, like Randy was saying, they want some trait in a plant that doesn't naturally occur. Like probably the most widely reason to do genetic modification is resistance to herbicides, right? So, so like, like a lot of people have probably heard of Roundup Ready crops. Like there's no, there's no existing gene for, for resisting Roundup, right? So they had they had to go figure out how to, I don't even know where, I mean, where the genes came from, but they had to go f- figure out how to make a plant resistant to Roundup. And right, the whole, the whole idea is that you can apply herbicides to a Roundup ready crop and kill the weeds in the crop without killing your crop plant. Okay. So if, if that's hard for people to get their, their head around, like a really good example, we originally started our farm in Pennsylvania we shared the farmland with a dairy farmer who grew a lot of soy. And so, you know, he grew, he, he grew Roundup Ready soybeans. He would come through, plant the soybeans. The weeds would come up. The soybeans would come up. So you'd look out at the field and you would mostly see weeds, actually. You know, if you didn't know better, you'd think like, oh, that guy's in trouble. He's going lo- to lose his soybean crop because they're going to get completely overrun by all the weeds. But what he wanted was for all the weeds to sprout that were going to sprout and then he would come over the top with an herbicide. And because he was planting genetically modified soybeans that were modified to resist the herbicide, I think it was Roundup in that case, all the weeds would die. But because the soy had been genetically modified to be able to withstand you know, herbicide, the soybeans would survive, whereas all the, the weeds would die. So 
we want to be really careful and not confuse those two terms of hybrid happening completely naturally and genetic modification. And I think one of the possibly one of the reasons people get it confused is because hybridization, of course, isn't just birds and bees, right? Hybrid hybridity in vegetable crops or other other crops that that people are breeding themselves is often done deliberately, right? So let's go back to the example of your brandywine tomato and great white. Okay, so those are pretty famous varieties, right? They're, those are open pollinated heirlooms that have been been around for years, and people people preserve them. They breed true because they like them. You know, your grandma, my grandma could have grown either one of those tomatoes. They've been around for a long time. So let's say somebody wanted to breed a light pink tomato. So just like they would think like, well, brandy wine is pink and great white is about as white as a tomato can get. And so you say, well, if I add a, a, a white tomato to a, a pink tomato, I might get a light pink tomato. And so there's no, there's no genetic modification going on there. As traditional plant breeders do all the time is they take they take the male part of the flower and introduce it to the female part of the flower. So let's say they get the male, the pollen from a great white and introduce it to the ovary on the flower of a brandy wine. And then they know uh, it's just a controlled way of doing what the bee would do for you, right? Because if you, if you go out in your garden and the bees are flying around, you have no idea which, which plants they visited in what order, but you want to breed this light pink tomato, right? So, so you deliberately take the pollen from the white tomato and introduce it to the ovary of the pink tomato. And it's, you know, br plant breeding isn't an exact science. That's why there's fields and fields of, of, of breeding. Breeders, you know, Randy knows this, make tons of crosses to try to get the right, like a, a particular result. You know, it happens completely naturally. Unlike the, the genetic modification where there's, I mean, there's, I, I'm not even up on the technology. There's various ways that people try to, there's like a gene gun, which sounds pretty insidious all by itself. <laughs> there's also this CRISPR technology that I think, I think what's happening is in the early days of genetic modification, people didn't have as good a handle on the process. And so it was a little bit more shotgun approach with the gene gun where you're kind of like shooting, you know, shooting genes in there and then Whereas now, I think the whole innovation behind CRISPR, if I'm understanding it right, is that you, you can more more carefully, like Randy was saying, it's almost like computer code. People, just like people have sequenced the human genome, they're sequencing vegetable genomes, and there's certain par parts of the, the genetic code that will correspond to the color of the tomato, the flavor of the tomato, cold hardiness, all these different things. And so they're get, you know, people are getting better at uh, either taking out or inserting parts of the genome to get, you know, novel things like sure. Roundup resistance or pretty famously. Uh, so Randy's exactly right. Most of the, most of the genetic modification happens on what we would call agronomic crops, like crops that are harvested on a huge scale, like corn and soy and things like that. Cause it's actually at this point, it's pretty expensive to do genetic modification. So that's why we don't have any lettuce, like lettuce, First of all, I would say that mo most of the goals of lettuce breeders can probably be achieved pretty well through traditional breeding methods, but also it's really expensive. So if you look at, let's say here in the United States, the, the, the most seeds are sold for huge commodity crops like corn and soy, right? So if the process is really expensive to undertake in the first place, you're only going to do it on the crops that sell the most seed. And like we're talking about multipliers of soy. acres in the thousands. I mean, for if there's, if there's a, an acre of lettuce being grown there's 10,000 acres of corn being grown, probably more than that. So right. the, there's not enough financial windfall to invest that much time and effort. Sure. But, right. but I think, so that, that goal of being able to grab that specific gene is, is very important. Or once you figure out what it is, um, being able to fast track it. So let's, let's paint a picture here, right? Uh, Andrew was talking about, let's take a great white tomato and a brandy wine tomato, and we, we want pink. And so what's the days to maturity on a tomato? Like you might be waiting six months to find out how light pink did I get that tomato and I missed the boat because it's not pink enough or it's too pink or, you know, it tastes really bad. Turns out, hey, this, these two tomatoes don't taste well. So, you know, 
Andrew talked about a, a shotgun approach where maybe he's taking brandy wine and crossing it with a great white and a taxi and a Cherokee purple and 15 other tomatoes in the hopes that one of them maybe gets the color. And that's a six month commitment. He's checking those plants almost every day and maybe has a crew of one or two or three helpers going through that. If it's not pink enough, but it's close, well, he's going to save that seed and do it again next year because he's 25% closer to his goal. So where I'm going with this is to get the pink tomato he wants might be a eight-year effort with three or three or four staff members and a decent sized budget plus the from this land. breeding program and, and the land and and you know the harvest and saving seed and and cataloging it all and one of the things that these breeders using GMO techniques is they might be able to shave two years off or three years off a breeding program so instead of that eight year tomato it's now a five year tomato and when it comes to being shouldn't be the case here but let's say basil downy mildew is the biggest problem that basil growers face and it's not just in north america there's different strains in, in europe and all these breeders are racing to come out with a, a basil variety that can be resistant and stay resistant faster than the mildew can mutate to a different strain. I'm not saying there's any work being done in, in, in basil for GMOs, but that might be an example where if they can crack the secret on that three years faster than their competitors can, they're off to the races. They get three years of maybe a monopoly on basil seed purchases because they've got the hot new thing that is going to allow a basil grower to to succeed, right? So part of it's the speed at which they can implement because they know exactly what they're chasing and they can put it exactly where they need to. And now they just might need to solve for flavor or, or something like that. So, well, yeah, that's a really good point is that plant breeding is not an exact science. It's what traditional plant plant breeding is trial and error. And you try, you try a lot of different combinations and occasionally you get lucky and you get it really quick. But like Randy was saying, a lot of times it takes multiple years with multiple different crosses before you, you before you get exactly what you want to get. And so, you know, the gen genetic modification is an attempt to to speed up that process or or insert insert traits that don't have don't exist in the plant mm. in the first place, like mm. the herbicide resistance or there was a really famous tomato called the flavor saver. And so genetic modification, like we were saying, has not been big in the vegetable crops. And that's I think that's one of the reasons that Flavor Saver was so famous is because it's it's one of the few examples. It's really the only example that I can think of that, where a tomato has been commercialized, partially because it's so, it was so expensive. And it was a flop because what they did, I believe they took a, to, a fish gene, a gene from a fish mm -hmm. and put it in this tomato mm. to give it better shelf life, which is it's like. I thought it was cold hardiness, maybe. Maybe, but, yeah. But either way, it... basically, they, yeah, they, they, um, you know, they inserted a fish gene in a tomato, and it's, it's really, it's really cool. There's a, there's a farm and garden writer named Carol Depp, D E P P E, and she has a book. She, she's written some books about plant breeding. She breed, read, wrote a book called "Breed Your Own Vegetable Varieties" and things like. She's written some other books. So if, if people are really interested in this, actually Carol Depp's books would be a good one to get. And she's a very traditional plant breeder, but it was funny for, to read about in her book. She talks about going out and like getting the flavor saver. Because I, I, I don't want to speak for her, but I don't think she's, you know, she, I don't think she's the kind of person who would support genetic modification, but she just like wanted, was curious. It wasn't very good. You know, apparently people didn't like it. Like, it was a commercial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just go, just it's it's easier just to go fishing exactly and so by and large vegetable growers don't actually have to be too worried about like accidentally buying vegetable seed because i know that's when i worked when i worked at the seed company you know people were like like i don't want any of that genetically modified hybrid seeds and like randy said there's 
I can I don't think I can't think of a tomato that's on the market today that's that's genetically modified. Yeah, maybe like some a few zucchini. You know, there's some sweet corn actually because there's it's in corn. You know, co corn has been genetically modified a lot. But other than sweet corn and zucchini, I can't really think of any what about garden the Heinz varieties. Tomato, the famous Heinz were ketchup. That's that was that's a hybrid too. Literally well, I mean, I think Heinz, Heinz is the name of the company. And no, it came from that tomato though. That was their bred breed of that, and they own that. I, I would almost guarantee that's a mix of different tomatoes. Like the Heinz ketchup, I bet it's different ones. I'm not an, an expert on by any stretch, but I've I've talked to some farmers that supply companies like Del Monte or Heinz or, or whatnot with product. And one of some of those farmers, what they'll do is they'll plant tons and tons of field tomatoes that are actually like really hard. <laughs> and because they mechanically process them, if you've ever seen like a mechanical uh, processing of carrots, there's a big conveyor belt that goes underneath the ground, pushes the carrots up, you know, shakes the debris off and throws in the back of a dump truck. And some of these field tomatoes are harvested the same way. There's nobody walking out, picking them out of the field. It's a machine separating the tomato from the vine thro and throwing it in a dump truck. And one of the characteristics that they're chasing is one, for the tomato to be able to survive that, and two, um, a very, very specific consistency that'll go through the plumbing in the factory. If the, if the tomato's too juicy and, and too liquidy, you know, it doesn't give them the consistent of that final product. If it's too thick, it won't go through their plumbing. So that that's the deciding factor on what makes a good ketchup tomato is something as silly as the manufacturing plant wants it at a certain pressure going through their plumbing pipes. Let me ask you this. So uh, just as a regular farmer, where are these breeding programs taking place and, and who are these breeders? Like, how are they getting funded and where do they get their money to live off of and, and continue to operate for a hypothetical eight years? Like, I mean, because Carl, I mean, when's the last time you ever heard of a tomato breeding farm you know you just don't see it and then like this it's this whole sub industry of farming that's supplying the rest of the farmers so where's this taking place sure well let's let's break it down into a couple of categories right like a plant breeder might be someone with a, a science background in in school pet project you know maybe they were a biology major maybe they were a chemistry major and through their studies they've got some skills in potential breeding they may start out as techs at a seed company, working underneath another breeder, and a seed company might be paying them for their work. You know, uh, we're paying you a yearly salary to, I want you to breed me the best carrot you possibly can. And oh, by the way, the market wants it to be bright orange. It wants a good shelf life. It wants to be able to plant both in the spring and not bolt in the fall and, and on and on and on. Good, good, nice top. And it may take you eight years to breed it. To, and so, to get so that. we can say that, let's say they hook a carrot grower up with that. Mm -hmm. They may have 20 carrot growers doing 20 different projects in the hope that one is actually successful. They may have one carrot breeder on staff working on chasing 20 different goals. They might be working on the same time an orange carrot, a purple carrot, a storage carrot, a baby carrot, and that might be on their list of to-dos to come to bring that to market. So, And the purple one might be two years out, the baby one might be four years out, um, and so on and so forth. And then when they've stabilized that, and so not only have they got the genetics they want and the characteristics, but they can then prove that the carrot seed that they spent the last 10 years making also has to be good at making carrot seed. And that's a big, a big challenge for breeders. Like you might have all the characteristics you want, but when you plant it in the ground, let it go to seed. If you only get five seeds off that plant, that's not economically viable for the seed company to keep producing. Right? So 
that's a piece of the process. And some of these plant breeders work for seed companies. Some of them might be a university. It might be a pet project and they've, they've dedicated their career and it's just one person. You know, I, I can think of a few people that had their own one man, one woman show breeding program and Johnny's would go every year and walk their tomato field or pumpkin field and say, I like that one. Call me next year. Maybe you can clean up the color on that. Those genetics go to the highest bidder, right? And maybe Johnny's bought it. Maybe Osborne bought it. Maybe Seedway bought it. So at this point, I want to pause Carl as a representative of all the market gardeners out there. What do you? Really good stuff. I've, I've been trying to mentally keep notes of two big questions I have, but that was really good on that. On that last note you made about, you know, them going and doing that, just seeing the, the process of that. And it reminded me of, I think, of one story of this guy, the personal, the, you know, mom-pop type shop. I think his, I don't know what his name is, but I, I think this guy created the Mortgage Lifter. That was his tomato variety. Oh, yeah. You know, like he's just a one-off guy, from what I understand, yeah. who, who you know, that was his goal was to make this this one seed. So it's interesting that you don't have to be a yeah. science. You know, maybe, maybe he is, has a background in that, but as far as I know, he didn't. Or you know you could be these large these out large outfits. I have a, a, a hybrid question, a pollination question for y'all because this is it's more on the pepper side. Because I thought this was a big myth. I don't know if y'all can answer this, but you know this: don't plant your sweet peppers next to your hot peppers because they'll cross pollinate, right? And then your sweet peppers might get hot, and your hot peppers might be sweet, which that to me baffles me because typically, like in tomatoes, like you said earlier pollination affects the seeds of the plant of the next oh it's just dawned on me what i just said <laughs> the seeds are inside there <laughs> oh, i just answered my own question yeah, during that. that's hilarious i mean that is it's that's you would only have to be careful about that if you're saving your old your own seeds or okay. selling to the public which i have done and somebody came back to me the next week and said hey carl that purple bell pepper was hot yeah <laughs> but it that probably wasn't that probably wasn't your mistake it was probably the mistake of the person who who bred it, because well, no, I'm saying I planted my hot peppers right next to my sweet peppers, uh-huh. and so I heard that this meth, and I said, "There's no way that's true," and two years in a row it happened to me. So either I had two coincidental c- scenarios, mm-hmm. but I've had other farmers telling me the same thing: like if you plant your hot and cool peppers next to each other, you're risking your hots becoming hot, sweet and your sweets becoming hot. And I blew it off. I'm like, there's no way. Like that makes no sense because it should be the next year's pro, you know, seed. But as that's what I was saying. As I'm thinking through, well, those seeds are what's hot, and that's mm-hmm. what's burning them. Mm-hmm. That, so, that capsaicin is generally in that seed cavity. Yeah, I wonder. Um, I Anyways, hadn't, I hadn't heard that that myth. I I can't say whether it's plausible or or true or or false, but I can I can see where that could be a thing in that in that particular scenario. It, look, it's not like we're any shortage of old wives' tales and myths in farming here. I mean, everything yeah. is, yeah. everything can be confused. Well, it's just, and that's you, what I thought. You're planting too, under the I right new it. moon, right? Well, now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think that's probably more from back when people were maybe saving their seeds because it's, that's obviously, that's, I mean, that's, that's true that if, if you were saving your seeds and you had hot peppers next to sweet peppers, I mean, there's, it gets even more complicated though because, some some plants are outcrossers. Uh, they're like okay, so winter squash, for example, it actually has male and female flowers in it, and they're very open. So they tend to the term that breeders use is promiscuous. And so, like <laughs> corn, for example, so corn is very promiscuous because the the pollen is wind dispersed, right? right? So corn 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 really suffers very easily from inbreeding depression, meaning if just like what it's out. It's just yeah. like in people and animals. If you if inbreeding very quickly results in a decline in vigor and in tra- traits in in corn, and so corn has mechanisms in other crops like corn and winter squash that 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 have the physiology of their flowers basically lends itself towards towards crossing. It it almost has to be to be crossed with 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 pollen from another plant, whereas. Uh, so, so plant typically, like not always, but plants that suffer from inbreeding depression quickly are promiscuous. They, they, the physiology of their flowers almost 
<laughs> yeah, the, it, it almost ju- it almost guarantees that they're going to get crossed w- w- from another plant. Okay, and there's other crops like the solanaceous crops. Okay, so solanaceous, right? We're talking peppers, tomatoes, eggplants. There's other others in the the solanaceous nightshade family. Speaking of things that you want to eat, it's mainly tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. They're natural inbreeders. This is meaning that so tomatoes are a good example of this. Tomatoes are already pollinated frequently by the time the flower even opens. Because so tomatoes are what they call a perfect flower. I mean, it has the male and female parts of the flower on in the same flower to, to the point where the it's already mature enough. So by the time you see that little yellow tomato blossom open, they're usually already pollinated. And so that's why variety of tomato that you really want to save and keep like, you, you know, your grandma's strain of brandy wine or like varieties that have been handed down through their family. It, it would be a good idea to plant like if, if you're saving seed of, of your granddaddy's, you know, unique favorite tomato to plant that tomato somewhere like a long way from any other tomatoes. And they're like, if you wanted to do this, it's called an isolation distance based on how promiscuous the plan is like corn has to have a huge like isolation. Two miles, I think, something like y- that. Yeah, yeah. Corn has to be so if you want corn to breed true, like all right, so you know, like if you have your yeah, your your granddaddy's like special variety of sweet corn that's that is an open pollinated, right? So you save the same seed each year and it, it comes back. To ensure no cross pollination, because corn is so promiscuous, you have to plant your granddaddy's corn like two miles away from any other corn. And mm. this is a table. You can, look, you can look this up. Breeders use this to go back and talk about Johnny's again. I used to go sometimes with the seed, the seed production coordinator at Johnny's to ensure isolation distances. Like sometimes we would do cucumber seed productions. We would go talk to people and talk them out of growing any cucumbers. Like if we, if we, knew, if we knew we wanted to do a cucumber seed production in some field and it was surrounded by neighbors who had gardens we would go talk to those people and try to talk them out of growing any cucumbers so the bee the bee wouldn't come visit whatever home gardener cucumber is growing and then take it over to some kind of thing that we were doing for a seed production which is seed production even if it was an open pollinated it would be a whole field of the same variety and i forget what the isolation distance on it cucumbers it's probably how far a bee flies or something like that because because cucumbers aren't wind pollinated right So, so it's not is the pollen it's not so much that the, the pollen is like blowing in the wind it's that you know if you have your production field of open pollinated yeah. cucumbers right here you have like an acre of the same like so you long or whatever right and then next door is someone's garden you, we would act, we would go be like will you agree not to grow cucumbers we will bring you cucumbers all season yeah. long to, to try to ensure ensure that 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 one comes true by the physiology of tomatoes and peppers and eggplants they are all they all tend to be in inbreeders. They they don't suffer very much from inbreeding mm. t- depression, and so because of that, the the flowers and because they're perfect flowers with male and female parts in the fa- same flower, they tend to breed true. Like a lot of times, if you have ten different varieties of tomato, open pollinated tomato in a field, you can take those tomatoes and you'll get the same one. But there's there's some small chance that a, that um, that they do get crossed. You know that like a bee that that the ovaries of that tomato flower were still um fertile on the day that a bee visited another tomato and you'll you'll get some crossing that's why that's why you have to have these huge isolation distances on corn yeah. and Ooh, and cukes and it's it's a it's a the isolation distance is much smaller on the the nightshade family the solanaceous crops because they tend they tend to inbreed naturally i think there's two two things that uh i thought about when you were mentioning that andrew so Nick, you, you talked about, you know, why is this seed so expensive? And that's part of it, right? Sometimes it's an isolation distance and it's talking growers around the seed producer not to plant, you know, cucumbers. Sometimes these crops are planted in exclusion tents where it's literally a tent that will not let insects in or out. And so it forces only the things within that tent to pollinate with each yeah. other, right? There's no outside influence. You can have like a clean room. <laughs> exactly. I mean, this is made out of insect nets. A lot of pepper seeds, good productions tend to be hand pollinated. So you're you're actually paying a laborer to, you know, it might be a clothespin on a paper bag over this flower 
to make sure that no other pollen gets to it. You're really doing a lot on this podcast series for the clothespin industry. <laughs> this is the second time to podcast. And, and so they will, a laborer will take that bag off that flower, whether it's a Q-tip or a toothbrush, introduce some pollen to that flower, and then rebag it to ensure that flower got only the pollen that they wanted mm. to get to it. And that labor is expensive. Those exclusions are, are expensive. And so that's part of the cost. We're, we're talking eight to 10 years. We're talking possibly hand pollinations, exclusions, trial and error, multiplications out, a 10-year investment in a breeding program before you sell your first tomato seed. Okay. The, 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 go ahead. Sorry. Two questions on that. Um, let me say both questions. And the first question is acclimation. So I want to talk about acclimation seeds like Southern acclimate. I see that mm -hmm. term all the time. I think it'd be good for this. But the other term on that, uh, what you were just talking about, the other question is, can you with that model to shave off that six month time, uh, pollinate one set of flowers? So like, say you got cherry tomatoes you're doing, right? And you've got this cluster over here you're pollinating with whatever, edox or something. And this one over here you're doing with some other variety, right? I mean, mm -hmm. can you on the same plant create two different or is it they just don't do that? They isolate them too much. Yeah, I, I mean, if I'm understanding your question is, can you make two different hybrids or two different crosses, you say, on the same plant? Yeah. And you, definitely. In fact, mm -hmm. a, a lot of times, yeah, because if you think about it, it's like the, the, the plant that is receiving the pollen is essentially is the mother. I mean, that's how, right. that's how breeders talk about it, is the mother, mother and father. And it, and it actually makes a difference because some crops, some crops make a different, slightly different offspring. Plant A is the mother and plant B is the father because it's, it's a little different than with people, right? If you think about it, because most plants, even if they don't have male and female parts on the same flower, have male and female parts on the same plant. So, yeah, the, the, a lot of times what breeders will do is they'll actually label the individual flower. Right. As the you know, they'll, they'll hand pollinate a single flower and have some manner of like a tag or something where it'll say, I mean, they know, you know, the, the plant itself will be labeled. So it'll be plant, you know, plant number one pollinated by plant number two. And so they'll know what plant number one is because it's the mother. Right. But then they'll still put a little tag that says plant number one crossed mm. with essentially the father is plant number two so yes on the same plant at the same time let's say let's say plant one is the mother plant could have let's say we're cherry tomatoes okay so tons tons of flowers right cherry tomato so plant number one is the mother gets pollen from the father is plant number two and then another flower also on plant number one gets pollen from plant number three i mean you could have an unlimited number yeah, of fathers essentially you only limited by the number of plant of flowers on that plant and that's what that's what it, it's like you go into a breeding greenhouse and you'll see you'll see the where they've done deliberate hand crosses each one will right. be labeled because that information is so important because if it ends up being a really good cross you know they need to know what what the mother and father is because then they can right. they can replicate it you know so the main the same plant might have dozens you know, right yeah potentially dozens yeah. of fathers on that i mean now, it's good to note that that tomato is going to all look the same. You're not going to know until, like what you said, it's going to be the following year. right? Exactly. You're not going to come out like with, if you bred it with 16 different colors tomatoes, you're not going to have a Medusa looking tomato tree, you know, tomato mm -hmm. that's got a plant that's got all these different colors. They're all going to look the same, but the seed is what is going to be impacted. Yeah, and that's so. that's that's the thing that makes breeding take so much time yeah. is you have to wait for that seed to mature it, before you then go, go plant it out. Right. And that's one of the reasons... Like that, there are not that many independent tomato breeders anymore. Yeah, it's right. it's an expensive, time-consuming time process, and and so I mean, there's there's also natural ways to speed up the process. It's not like genetic modification is the only way. In fact, that's why you know a lot of the breeders that I've talked to that are into natural breeding, they say like, well, we can we can achieve our goals without having to go down that road of, of genetic modification. Right. It's just more money, you yeah, know. Because yeah. one one thing that some companies will do is they'll make cross in the north and then as soon as that seed is is ripe instead of waiting a, a whole another season for another summer in the north they'll immediately sprout it and plant it farther south you know mm -hmm. so it helps it 
that's why a lot of this breeding is done by bigger companies who may have multiple sites because they can actually yeah. accelerate the breeding process. They may be able to get through th several breeding cycles by planting either in a greenhouse. You know, you might be able to get through several breeding cycles in a season, either in a greenhouse or by making it, you know, a cross in the summertime in a more northern area and then growing progeny of that cross out in a southern area. So there's, there's other ways to accelerate the breeding timeline other than genetic modification. Let's say... They've cracked the code. They found the perfect tomato by making all these crosses. And they have Cherokee purple version 634, second cross, third generation, is the perfect mix to go with great white number 473, third generation. You know, because they've done all these combinations. And they know that's the secret. And they've got 10 seeds. And now we got to wait oh. four years to breed and produce enough of the father and the mother to be able to pollinate enough to for pallets of seed right. now to sell you a packet and you a packet and you a packet. Yeah, yeah. It, so there's time and even just the seed production right. and, and multiplication. But I think this is going to answer your other question, Carl, about different regions and acclimations and and. Andrew kind of uh, foreshadowed some of this when he said his grandma's strain of, of a variety. So when you have hybridized, you know, varieties, a, a, a plant breeder picked this very specific uh, mother and this very specific father, theoretically, that variety should be the same for that, you know, that offspring. It should be identical twins over and over and over and over and over again. And that's one of the pros of a hybridized seed. And so if you'll find there, are, let's say that for instance, there's 30 seed companies in the U S most of the seed productions are done in Colorado and Arizona because they're dry climates. And so less humidity means less plant disease. Because if we spent 10 years breeding that carrot, we want to make sure there's no plant disease in that seed production because if that seed is diseased, I can't sell it, right? So when that seed is done being produced and saved and cleaned and tested and make sure it's, it's good quality seed, it's pure, and it passes germ, they're going to sell that same seed to those 30 different seed companies. And it doesn't matter if you bought that Nelson carrot from... Johnny's or High Mowing or Osborne or Southern Exposure, Baker Creek, whoever, it's the same exact genetics. And it's going to work the same for everybody. Now, if we go back to the example of open pollinated varieties, and, and when Andrew said uh, his grandmother's strain of Cherokee purple or, or whatever the exact phrase. So let's say today Andrew and I or you and I would probably be a better example. You and I decide we're going to save some money. We're going to buy one packet of seed. I'm going to take half the seeds home. You're going to take half. And it's an open pollinated heirloom variety like Cherokee Purple, Brandy Wine, whatever. At my house, man, I love that, that pink color. And so when I plant 10 plants, I'm only going to save the 10 pinkest fruits to save seed for next year. You plant it down Texas and you're like, hmm, I really like the flavor of this particular tomato I just picked. I'm gonna save the seeds out of that tomato. Next year I'm gonna plant from my batch, you're gonna plant from your batch. Five years from now, saving seed every year where I'm it's still a, a brandy wine tomato, but I've lo and behold been selecting for color. Yeah. And you've been selecting for flavor and I bet if I brought my a pink brandy wine tomato to you, it's gonna look a little different than yeah. yours. And it's some of it might be the 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 region, and some of it just might be the way we selected it is different from each other. And and now my strain of pink brandy wine is different than yours. It's almost like bourbon making how they. I mean, because they're it's really they're 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 picking the choice out of even though it's the exact same ingredients every time they're doing the same thing over and over mm -hmm. again 
that still of uh, they're picking you know they're they're sure. taking a mix and mash and 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 doing their selection process in a similar way but like i've heard this term southern acclim- in fact i bought seeds it said southern acclimated so i don't know if it's the same thing seed packets southern acclimated so it was this tremendous almost every seed that i could buy i could also purchase a southern acclimated sure so and did they just like pick the tomatoes that were growing in the middle of august in texas you know i, I don't know marketing? the company i think it's a marketing ploy what i'm not a big i don't put a lot of stock in the acclimated to the environment right like i said if it's a hybrid it's probably all grown in the same spot it's the same genetics they're all identical twins of each other open pollinated just because your local hardware store sells seeds doesn't mean that packet of seed came from was produced by a grower in that state it's probably still produced in Colorado, Arizona. What may be different is if we put the into the, this this perspective, right? The if Andrew was the product manager at Johnny's selecting for 350 different varieties in Maine and he selects the best ones, he might unbiased he might have some sort of bias in there. In the ones that performed best in Maine were at the top of his list because he's he's going for performance and those ones performed in that climate. So mm-hmm. what a good seed company will do is they will replicate their trials in other areas. They will do they'll plant 350 varieties in Maine and 350 in Texas. Andrew will evaluate everything in Maine and say these are the 10 that perform best. He'll hop on a plane, come down to Texas, and they'll say, Well, five of these we're at the top. The other five are different variations, but I know that I feel pretty confident that these five are the best. They were probably at least bigger. It, right. So, uh, <laughs> um, of course, that I'm done. but that's, <laughs> yeah, where's that room shot? you know, I yeah, think, yeah. I think that hopefully that kind of paints a picture of some of the myths and marketing ploys that people buy into because that's all they know. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, it, it brings up a really interesting question, though. And, you know, as far as the whole southern acclimated thing, there there could be something to that. You know, I think I think it's it's like like so many claims that are made by anybody selling anything. It's worth investigating because if you think about it, in the past, like everything else in agriculture, seeds and everything used to be much more local, right? We didn't have multinational companies basically collaborating with breeding projects in different parts of the world, try to breed certain varieties. And then there's, there is a certain degree of standardization that comes with, you know, multinational companies trying to breed. And by multinational, I don't necessarily mean anything bad by that. I just mean a lot of the seeds in the world are developed by big companies because they have, they have a lot of resources. Like mm-hmm. we're talking about, this is an expensive project and even genetic resources. You know, the bigger the company is going to tend to have more more assets you know so mm-hmm. more varieties it's may even be sending people out into the wild like i know that's one thing they do you know tomato came from C- central america right and so there are some there are scrappy you know varieties to either actual tomatoes uh like a persicum like a pers. there's all these other different varieties of tomatoes like like a persicum Hirsutum and like all these different things that are close tomato relatives that developed in Central America that may be surviving in the middle of the high desert because they either have extreme cold tolerance or they have disease resistances that your garden variety tomato doesn't have. And so, so a lot of breeding companies are probably sending people like, I, I like to imagine a breeder with like a pith helmet on out, like climbing down a cliff, you know, yeah. finding some weird little tomato relative that's natural, but is, you know, is surviving on in a very difficult environment. And so that's there, people are still doing that is, is sending people out into the, the area where it crops develops to try to find wild varieties that may have say disease resistance. To that, that our garden variety tomatoes don't have. But one interesting trend that I've seen in seed companies in the last few years is we're starting to get regional seed companies again. So a couple that come to mind are they're like Adaptive Seeds up in the Pacific Northwest. And there's a company called Commonwealth Seeds, which is in Virginia. And so 
you know, they're trying to do sort of like the, uh, they're de deliberately trying to breed varieties that will deal with the, the weather conditions of those areas. And I can't think of a company in Texas or the Southwest for that matter. There probably are. You're probably going to get, I mean, I yeah. hope, I hope people will write in, not like, yeah, that'd be great. Know, that, that may be a blind spot. I hope, I hope people will, will, will comment, you know, there's, there's probably somebody working on regionally adapted seeds for Texas or for the Southwest. But my point here is that adaptive seeds up in Oregon, they're working on Pacific Northwest developed varieties. Commonwealth seeds in the, in Virginia is developing varieties for the, the Southeast. And it was interesting in the magazine a couple of months ago, we had a profile of a farm in Alabama called Mountain Sun Farm. And as just kind of like a sidebar, there's sort of like the rundown on the farm, how many acres and favorite varieties. And they mentioned a, a variety of butternut squash from Commonwealth seeds in Virginia. And so I'm like, okay, well, that, that makes sense. Farm in Alabama would get a variety developed by a company in Virginia specifically to hold up to the heat and humidity in you know, pests and diseases and things that we have here in the Southeast. And so I think, you know, it's just a matter of doing your homework is like, if, if you see a packet that says, you know, like Southern adapted or whatever, it could be just marketing could be, could be right. something. Cause they, there definitely are, like, you know, we all know there, there are regional conditions, right? It's wow. really, it's really different thing growing in Texas than it is growing in Maine, right? And so I think there's, you know, there's something to that. And that's, that's why those companies are in business. They're trying to, uh, you know, they're the ones, they're growing their seed lines. They're doing their, their breeding and development in, in those particular conditions. And so they may well have some varieties, particularly if it's hard to grow, you know, like some particular crop in, in a region, you know, they may be getting closer, quicker than other companies on, mm -hmm. on, on having a good variety. So it's worth it's worth looking into. Yeah. Less about the sorry, <laughs> it's less about the uh, necessarily where that seed was produced, but it's more of the variety and the characteristics selected, right? So it goes right, back right. to I think a plant can be good at everything. It maybe it's flavor, maybe it's disease resistance, and you may find that Intimidator Bean does a great job with heat set, and so that might be the best green bean for Texas. But a grower in Maine might want jade for if it tastes better or yada yada. So mm -hmm. it's it it's less about where was that seed produced and what were the characteristics that were selected by the breeder and uh, how does that play into the challenges in your Yeah, that, that's a good point. And it probably has a lot more to do with where the the seed was selected and bred than where it was actually produced because like like Randy said there there really are there are parts of the area of the country and even parts of the world do a disproportionate amount of seed production because of yeah dryness dryness is a really big thing because it's you're less likely you know seed crops are very valuable right if if everybody's seeds aren't like a factory you know if all of a sudden everybody wants one variety you can't just like put on 24 hour shifts you know it's like you have to have a forecast the previous year of how much seed you're producing. Not only does your forecast have to be right, but the production has to survive, right? Because right. sometimes, like, if you're wondering, sometimes, uh, you know, you crack open the seed catalog, you're like, I want that variety, or maybe it's your favorite variety for years, and then you call up the seed company to order it, and they don't have any. I mean, there's a lot of things that could happen, but, you know, there might, maybe everybody else discovered that variety. Maybe it got really popular that year, or maybe there was a, a, cr a crop production on the seed production. So that's why that's why companies really do l tend to locate productions in areas that are dry, because you know, I mean, it seems counterintuitive. There's a lot of growing that happens in places that we otherwise consider deserts. I mean, that that's one thing is, for better or for worse, if you can get water there, deserts are great places to grow things because. Maybe not high desert because high desert has really cold temperatures also. You know, low desert conditions, there's a lot of sunlight and it's dry. And your seed, your seed production is less likely to, to fail because of disease pressure or have disease on, on the seed itself. And so I think it's totally legit that a company, say in Virginia, could have, could have selected the parents in Virginia and said like, oh, these, like, this combination makes a really good butternut squash. 
that holds up to the heat and humidity of the South. Maybe they send it to somewhere else to get it produced. But, you know, as long as they did the selection and breeding there and know, know that it, it, it thrives, you know, say, in the Southeast, like, that's, that's solid. It sounds like we could do a whole separate podcast just on <laughs> the, the importance of on-farm trials would be uh, an interesting topic yeah. and how valuable, you know, 50 feet of row space can be for a, a grower. Um, I won't go down that rabbit hole, but I think, I think that's a, a worthy discussion for another day. Well, I mean, I think, I think we've discussed hybrid seeds about as much as we can today without getting too scientific and I'm trying to keep everybody's attention. So what I want to do is move into now that we understand what a breeding program looks like for hybrid seeds, I want to now look at how are seeds getting from a breeder to a grower that's going to grow the seeds and what that process looks like, and then where it goes through a seed company, which, as we all, I think, understand now, seed company ABC is not growing all the seeds that it sells. It's more of a distribution house for other seed growers mm -hmm. to funnel in through hopefully do some trials and make sure they are what they say they are. So let, let's kind of go down that route a little bit to see how a package of seeds will get into Carl's hands. So we've talked about the, the, the breeders, you yep. know, they may work for a university, they may get subcontracted out. They may just be doing it independently. Once the variety is set and we're happy and there's a PO cut for X amount of thousands of pounds of this seed, that's going to get then through the seed company's marketing channels, and this is what it's for, and it's going to get in the catalog. What's that in between look like? I think uh, that's still a, a few years, right? The genetics have been nailed down. We know exactly what we want, but we've got 10 seeds or a pound of seeds, and we need to make that 5,000 pounds of seed. Ideally, what that would do is, let's say we're talking pumpkins. A good seed company would probably contract that seed multiplication out probably with two or potentially three quality pumpkin seed growers. Now, a good pumpkin farmer might be a great pumpkin farmer, but that doesn't mean they're a good pumpkin seed farmer. And Andrew may have dabbled in tomato seed production on his farm doesn't mean he's a good pumpkin seed producer, right? So it's important that a company would place a seed production with a knowledgeable seed producer that's familiar with the crop. And the equipment. And the equipment, which is key, right? So producing seed is not hard. Producing seed that's disease-free is... Weed free. Weed free, which is huge. And dried appropriately, that's going to help the shelf life. You know, so does that, does that seed producer have seed sorting equipment that's going to pull the weed seed out? Is it going to color sort and any broken hulls that might be a slightly different color get pulled out? Is it going to be humidity controlled and dialed in where it can dehydrate the seed to the perfect moisture content level that's going to let it sit on a shelf for three years? But that's the the breeder or the seed house. They're probably going to send and have Andrew do a production in Maine and Carl do a production in Texas and maybe even one in South America because if Carl gets hail damage, he's done. And we can't bet a 10-year breeding program on the fact that Carl's not going to get hail this year so, or that late blights or powdery mildew isn't going to decimate Andrew's crop or the corn grower across the street from me isn't going to spray Roundup that's going to drift into my crop and kill it. Or believe it or not, sometimes people's cows get loose and eat the crop. It, I mean, anything can happen. So... If they're smart, they'll they'll diversify where they're where they're doing that, and they'll probably approach that seed producer, our seed multiplier, with a contract that says, you know, I need you to produce X amount of seed or X amount of acreage worth of seed. I'm going to pay you X dollars per pound 
if you can meet my quota. If you exceed your quota, I'm still not going to give you the $5 a pound on the first stuff, but you know, I'll help you out and I'll buy anything extra you make for $3 a pound. Mm -hmm. And so the grower, if they're a good grower may produce extra and they're not stuck with all this extra seed. They're still rewarded for their efforts. The seed company got extra seed, so on and so forth. But they've hedged their bets by placing with a, with a few growers. And they know that seed might last them five years, two or three years in. They're probably going to start thinking about more because they can't wait for the last year before they run out because of hail or a flood or cows get into it. They're done, you know, so... They've got that kind of backup built in. Across all the seed companies, there's going to be markers as to this is a quality outfit to buy from. These are their standards. These are what they do. The thing I liked about what you guys did was that that whole trial farm, having gone to it twice over two separate seasons, of course, meeting you and meeting a few of the other folks that were there at the time, I saw, and that's why I really wanted to do this is because I wanted to take that that person that's like, I'm not paying a dollar for seed to listen to all this and listen to everything that goes into it and then meet the people behind it, or at least you guys are representing, you know, the breeders on, on their behalf at this point. There's just so much more to go into it. And when you look at a, a life event where all of a sudden there's no seeds to be had because there was a run on seeds that we had a couple of years ago, to eliminate that seed supply uncertainty, there was a finite amount. And year over year, there's a finite amount. So this whole order before you need it, Carl, make sure that you're, you're going to get all your seeds in time. You should probably order as early as possible because you never know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. These are valuable, valuable lessons. And I'm, I'm hoping to shed some light onto why things take so long and why you just can't turn on the switch and sure. get more seeds. And keep in mind, we're, we're at the mercy of nature, right? So like basil seed's been a little tough. There's a lot of basil downy mildew going around. And for probably the most memorable one is, you know, maybe eight or so years ago, Andrew, like it was kale, right? Oh, Everybody yeah. wanted kale. There was no kale to be had. And it's not because suddenly kale was the, the most popular thing since sliced bread. I mean, that contributed a little bit to it. I mean, heard a story where 10 years ago, do you know who the, the biggest consumer or purchaser of kale was in the United States? Iguana owners. That's not a bad guess. Anyone want to throw a guess? No. Th that was my first introduction to kale. My brother's iguana. <laughs> the, the biggest consumer of kale in the U.S. was Pizza Hut using it on their buffet as just like a, a garnish. <laughs> One on the ice, they were the one of the biggest consumers of kale in the U.S. Right? Such a waste. Then you know, new marketing, health benefits. Kale's the the cool thing. And well, I mean, you can have an overnight X factor if if back in the day, and I think this happened. Is that's where I thought you're going. So if all of a sudden Oprah has some guru on mm -hmm. and all the minions, I mean, just imagine if Taylor Swift tomorrow says, "I'm only eating kale from here on out." It's lights out for the kale industry. Yeah. Yeah. Or Martha Stewart. Like I think right. in vegetables or especially flowers is like Martha Stewart has some, you know, like cafe au lait dahlia or something. And then like demand for cafe au lait dahlia. Is, is and so how, how 10 years ago is somebody to predict that? Sure. If it takes 10 years to get, uh, if everything goes right, it seems. Yeah. To get a new variety on. But that's just one of the pieces of the puzzle, right? So now let's let's think about some of the best breeders in the world for kale are three or four great companies based in the Netherlands. They have a very wet year and they get black rot, right? Black rot's a plant disease, tends to come on when there's a lot of humidity and moisture, the soil's really wet. Um, they get black rot. Black rot lives in the soil for like seven years, mm. right? It's one of the last things you want on your farm and these two, three seed companies struggled to then bring a seed crop to fruition two, three, four years in a row, these pallets of seed sitting in the warehouse 
that's supposed to be, you know, short term while they make more. Well, more could never be made because of weather issues. They deplete the resources. There's no more seed left in the warehouse. We're done for the next two years until we can bring a, a kale seed crop to fruition. And that's kind of what's going on with basil right now. Like basil and mill decimating seed production in uh, Israel, I think is a popular uh, producer of basil seed. And you get a bad weather event a few years in a row. Uh, carrot seed production has been tough. Carrot, there is a killer pest that will prefers to suck on like the flowers of carrot seed of of carrot plants and so the plant will produce seeds but those seeds don't have any viable germ in them so now you have what you think is a great carrot seed production year and then you test the seed after you've done all the work and oh, it's only 40% yeah. germ and it's not marketable and if that particular pest is decimating the Netherlands or Europe or Colorado, Arizona, or wherever that seed's produced, you're gonna feel you're gonna feel that pressure. I, I remember being concerned as microgreens became more and more and more popular. That where the hell are all these seeds coming from? Because if one seed is gonna grow one plant, now all of a sudden, you know, an ounce of microgreen seeds is requiring several hundred, like. How how did that kind of hit the industry? I've, I've always been curious about that. I mean, I think microgreens are like the seed company's dream come true, sure. right? It's like instead yeah. of instead of one seed, one plant, it's like thousands of seeds I, just to make I sure get, it'll trend. Sure, but I guess my question is how how did they scale up making that much more seed all of a sudden? And I think you described it to me back in the day as uh, levels of seed quality could could play into that. The microgreen growing craze might seem like it's jumped out of nowhere but it i don't think that's fair to say I, I think it's been a steady incline and when a couple of seed companies saw it early and they started doing larger productions and they forecasted and then the next year it was a little bigger well they had kind of planned that to an extent one of the nice things about and this microgreens is a, a fantastic portion of this hybrid versus open pollinator or heirloom discussion is when you're spending six months growing a tomato in a temperature controlled environment and humidity controlled environment, and you need that maximum yield, you've got all of these factors that are, that are pre-planned. You need that specific exact variety and it needs to be dialed in for microgreens. This plant's, an inch tall, two inch tall. And so things that make that variety special tend to be non-factors. It needs to germ, it needs to taste good, and it helps if it maybe has a pretty leaf shape, right? So at that point, there's no need to spend a dollar a seed on a microgreen that's only getting two inches tall. So now we're, we're going back to, hey, these open pollinated Waltham broccoli, and uh, Detroit Red Radish, it might be Red Rambo. These are typically varieties that have been open pollinated and or heirloom, and the seed is very inexpensive to produce on, on large scales because we're not hand pollinating them, we're not segregating them. We just need them to germ at that point. And this $5 a pound seed variety does a great job of that. Hey, that might be the best variety going for microgreen production. So let's talk about Salanova lettuce. It's a staple of many market gardeners, a lot of hydro folks that we go to. Two things. It is an exclusive. Johnny's does carry it. I want to talk a little bit about the supply of that in that it, it's prim primarily going through Johnny's. Is that correct? L last I knew, it that particular type of lettuce, and we'll say type just like romaine is a type, butterhead's a type, salanova, or is a very particular breeding program's work in a, in like a, a multi-leaf type, right? And we're talking oak-leafed in size, yes. crisp. Yes, yep, yep, absolutely. And so the company that bred various salanovas is a, is a very prestigious breeding company called Rick Schwann. For a few years, they were selling it 
direct to some very large scale farmers doing large acreages in Salinas Valley and, and so on and so forth. They decided to, to partner with Johnny's on that as a as a distributor to the masses. Last they knew, Johnny's had the exclusive on that to sell and distribute to the masses. And it's worked out very well for them. When a company does that or has an exclusive, it's pretty common to have like minimum order thresholds, right? So if Andrew was a tomato breeder and Southern Exposure seed, seed said, hey, Andrew, we really like this tomato. We want to be the only seed company in the country that that offers it. He might say, yeah, great. Uh, we can do that. But if you want to be my main squeeze, you got to buy 2,000 pounds of this tomato seed because I know I can sell 500 pounds to high mowing and 500 pounds to Osborne and 500 pounds to Park and 500 pounds to Haas. And, and so... If I'm going to turn all those other people away, you need to promise me that you can meet this threshold. And if you can, I'll give you exclusive maybe for three years. We'll try this out. And if you can't meet that, I'm going to have to shop around. right? And, and Rick Schwann is, uh, and Salanova um, and their relationship with Donis has, has gone really well. And so it's such a game-changing product that customers have been sharing that their success stories with other other growers and it's it's done really well for them and then they've met their thresholds and they continue to last again last i knew to be the only game in town like that uh well and so, so. I, I bring salanova up also because as this conversation has alluded there's so much going on under the surface that for sure, farmers are not aware of. For sure, consumers are not aware of. But when it comes to Salanova and, the, and these exclusives, I'm trying to get market farmers to understand that there's such a bigger world out there. And so, while Carl, how many, how many, how much seed of Salanova would you go through in a year at, at your rate? Well, rate? we're growing. I mean, we're we're increasing, obviously. But I just placed another order for I think. We, we do about a thousand seeds every quarter, I think, of, of various varieties, three three or four different Salanova varieties. Okay, so, so we're talking, let's just... Less than 10,000 seeds probably a year. Okay, okay, and we, we, I'm pretty sure that's pretty common for a market-style farm. I'd say so. With some, with plus or minus 30%, right? Yep. And would it surprise you that these bigger growers are going through pallets, if not truckloads of that seed yeah. every month? Hey. I don't know uh, truckloads and pallets. That that might be a stretch, but I know I've had times where I've sold you know four hundred thousand seeds to an opera uh, like and a I, hydroponic opera. And that's, quick, that's quick what turnover, I'm thinking. Right? I'm, I'm thinking hydro in the sure. Netherlands. Yeah. that their whole multi-acre under glass facility is based off of deep water. Yep, churning it out absolutely at a crazy rate and and. At that scale, that might be a customer that the breeding company like Rexwan may want to service themselves and say, okay, we got a pretty big fish here. There's a lot on the line. Hey, Johnny's, maybe we, we want to service this one directly. Thanks for bringing them to our attention, but we'll, it's, we'll take it's it too from big here. to ha- There's, no, it, there's it also be. no point of shipping that across the pond and then back. Right. Uh, and I guess when it, when it comes back to the supply chain issues that we faced a couple of years ago, Who's going to get cut off first? Yeah, yeah, that can be that can be a tough one. I I will tell you historically from a seed company's perspective, the f- first customer to get cut off would be the brand new customer that's never purchased before, mm-hmm. or the customer that didn't forecast ahead of time. So if I'm your seed sales rep, Carl, you know, and you're buying high volumes of X, Y, or Z. My boss may come to me and say, hey, you know, there's been a shortage, a crop failure, hailed, hailed during the seed production. Shipping container what, fell off shipping the boat. Shipping container <laughs> fell off the, the, the boat, what, whatever. As a company, we're only going to get, you know, a million seeds of, of this. We are comfortable sending 50,000 seeds to Texas. Okay, if I'm the Texas-based sales rep, I might have 10 customers that I can piecemeal that out mm-hmm. to and you might come to me and say, 
hey, Randy, I really need 10,000 of this. And I might say, geez, Carl, like, I know you're good for it every every year, five years in a row you bought 10,000, but man, I can only scrape together five for you. Might want to supplement with some Rex or something. You might want to supplement with some some Rex or, hey, maybe we look at, uh, you know, the the easy leaf varieties out of uh, ends of Vitalis's program or or some of the other stuff out of Nunham's. Well, again, I just, I didn't want to harp too much just on Sal Nova just for the harp or not, but it, it just goes to show that, Hey, think about what it took to bring that to market, especially in that many varieties, mm. and then what it takes to maintain it, and then what happens with the just the volume, volume that that we don't even think about at our, at our level. I think it's important that growers always kind of think about like an A, B, and C option. You know, something happens. What's what's your plan B and what's your plan C? And um, I think those are important factors where maybe it is Rex or maybe it is easy leaf or, or whatever or if it's cucumbers and socrates is out of stock or is diva your backup is you know what you should always have that kind of game plan in mind so yeah dedicate a little bit of field space or hoop house space to trying what may be your plan b and plan c if it's spinach you definitely want to plan a b and c because those varieties swap out it seems like just about every other year carry from from a buyer's perspective none of this gets published none of this gets talked about uh-uh. it's it's all the the trade secrets that go into hey the carl doesn't even wasn't even largely aware of to the degree of how long things happen again we have this whole industry doing all these things behind the scenes and underwaters that never gets brought to the surface from a customer's pers- perspective that would buy from carl knowing what you know now i mean how do you even wrap your head around that? I, I have no idea because that was like, I told Randy, we took a little break and I said, I've never even thought about where the seeds have come from. The seeds are just seeds. They're there. But like, obviously they are not. This is, I've never even thought about the fact that there is somebody growing tomatoes just for the seeds. And that to me is just, so obvious but i never ever have ever thought about that i think it opens up a whole new line of deeper thinking that if we if we're going to say well i know my farmer and Uh i know i want to know where my food comes from but if we really want to know where the food comes and we start digging down the supply line and where these Mm -hmm. things actually happen we have to look 10 years in the past to see that the tomato that carl grew for you six months ago was actually 10, 12 years in the making. It's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Mm. Well, and it also gives me a lot more, not that I didn't already, but even more respect for Carl, like knowing how much decision, I mean, how many opportunities there are for him when he's picking his seeds. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I trust even more like that Carl's picking the best, you know, Carl's, getting some of this information and it's not just a tomato is a tomato. Right. Like I would have told you a week ago, tomato is a tomato, whatever. But y'all were even saying some of these varieties. I was like, I have no idea what y'all are talking about. Well, a week or two ago, we we did that Michael Bell podcast. Mm -hmm. We were talking about what's in our spring mix and we went into all that ridiculousness. (laughs) Yeah. And now, I mean, it just, it just infinitely expands and I guess what I would like to do is have have you get a chance to talk to Andrew for a minute, and Andrew vice versa. If there was something you wished the buying public understood about farming as far as this lens goes, knowing everything you know, I mean, what what, what would you want Joe Q. Public to walk away with? I would want Joe Q. Public just to know it, it's, it is it is complicated. So few people are involved in agriculture anymore, right? It's something like 1% of 1% or less of the population is, is farming now. I think it's like anything that people know hardly anything about as they, they tend to like m- most things, most industries are, are have complexities that if you didn't know anything about them, you wouldn't know. And so with 99% of the, the, public not um having any involvement in 
in agriculture, like maybe some gardening, but it's still like, yeah, there's there's levels of complexity like we've been talking about. Well, the seriousness ramps up. Not being able to grow a garden is one thing. Not be able to feed a community is a whole nother. Right. So um, I guess that's, you know, and I, I think uh, f- people assume farming is simple or the farmers are dumb or I think it's just important for people to know. There's a lot that goes into it. Like I think back, back like a few years ago when Michael Bloomberg was running for president, I don't know, there's a kind of an infamous clip of him going like, farming, simple. Put seeds in the ground, think grow. Yeah. Like, simple. You know, and it's like, I was like, oh my God. Like you just demonstrated your own ignorance. Right. You know nothing about farming if you think it's simple and that's all you do, you know? But I mean, that's, so I think it's just like, I mean, cons- consumers just need to know there's a lot you know to, to to putting you know getting food from getting food on their plate there's a lot of steps there's years right i mean if you think about you know not only the people who had to grow it the people who had to pick it the chain you know supply chain that gets it to people's plates with pe- which people think ab- about a little bit more i think because of covid you know mm-hmm. walking in and having seeing empty spots on the grocery shelves made people think a little bit but it, it, it goes you know there's a ten, there's 10 years of breeding work based on generations of, of seed saving, you know, that even got the variety that it is grown to their plate. So, you know, it's it's complicated. I mean, it's, it's fascinating, right? I mean, we could, we've, how long have we been talking about this? We may have been, you know, we might be, we're, I'm sure we're over an hour. We might be approaching two hours. Yeah. And it's, you know, for, I think for people like this, it's fun. It's fun to nerd out in a way. I mean, because I think it's, it's important right? It's, lit- it's literally what keeps people alive, right? So it's important and it's interesting, but most people, you know, most people eat every day and have no idea what, what levels of complexity it took to get them fed. I remember being at the farmer's market and it, of course I had a retail nursery too for ornamentals. And so we had ornamentals as a, a side sell. And I, God dang, man. I remember one lady came up and we had junipers and she says, are these GMO junipers? I was like, are you going to eat this? And she's like, no. I'm like, no, they don't make GMO junipers. But that's, and like, she was dead serious and like, obviously worried about even that thing being around her. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I wanted to do this episode in this depth without getting too crazy is next time somebody comes up to you at the market, Carl, I want you to be able to sit down and give an intelligent answer because going back to this whole series that we've been doing since day one, we started this new podcast is I want farmers to be an educated ambassador for small farming so that you don't go and have a misrepresentation that's going to trickle out and affect potentially a whole market or, or whatever the case may be. You don't know where these people are going to travel to. So we owe it to ourselves to listen to somebody that's been in the industry for this long that has the answers to to be able to speak on our profession. And when we talk about farming as a craft, I think about all the breeders out there that are doing the work. What are you giggling at? I, I start I start thinking about Cannonball and the uh, Kim Deal. Anyway, different breeders, but they they have all this work ahead of them about and behind them in this whole other craft that I just don't want to neglect giving them their applause and our admiration for the work they're doing to keep us all in business and fed. It's crazy. Yeah. Before, we, when we were talking about this episode at lunch, we wanted to bring up, and, and you brought up a good point, that this this is about hybrid. It's not about open pollination, but open pollination does have its place within farming, within gardening, within agriculture. Give us give us some uh, guiding lights as to this is where you would use open pollination uh, and, and why it's still such a very important part of what we do. Sure. I mean... Um... I think when we think about some of our favorite varieties and, you know, if I asked, well, I, I will, I'll ask Andrew, Andrew, what would you say if you could pick three tomatoes to go on a desert island with, you know, what would they be? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, if I uh, had the, if I were being warned that I was about to be stranded on a desert island and I could pick three uh, tomatoes, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, um, I, my, my favorites, uh, would be like, uh, German Johnson, uh, regular leaf strain. So getting, getting into strains here, there, there's a German Johnson potato leaf strain and there's a German Johnson regular leaf strain. I've found the German Johnson regular leaf strain to be, I like it better than the, I think more productive 
but you know. So I would take German Johnson, regular leaf, Cherokee purple, and Captain Lucky is Captain actually Lucky? Is, yeah. a, is one that, that a lot of people haven't haven't heard of. Uh, but I think he's just making these names. Up. No, <laughs> that's the that's that kind of green striped variegated. Yeah, Captain, and Ca- Lucky. Captain Lucky is an interesting example as a more because the other the other two that I know I named so um, German Johnson regular leaf and and Cherokee purple are are very old varieties. Like I don't even know. I, there might be a history out there. I don't know if they can even be traced back to any one person or if it's the kind of thing where. You know, a lot of these varieties have been saved in communities, you know, in regionally. Maybe certain varieties were susceptible to the diseases or the heat, the humidity or the pests of an area. So people stopped growing them. And, the, you know, the varieties that did well year after year are the ones that got saved. Right. So German Johnson and Cherokee Purple are probably more like that. Like they were their heritage varieties, heirlooms that have been saved for a long time. Whereas Captain Lucky, a more recent OP. I think it was bred by a guy in North Carolina, I forget his name, who found it in a gr- in a group of some other variety as a an, like he planted a row of some other variety and noticed this one tomato was different. And so sometimes that can be a mutation. And you know, like we really don't know. Like if let's say you plant, let I me mean, this happens all the time. Is people will plant out a row of plants and notice one that doesn't look like the other. A lot of times, if it's not any better than the others, they'd just be like, meh, whatever. That plant stands out, right? If it's particularly beautiful, if it's not susceptible to pests or diseases that the other ones are going down to, if it tastes better than the other ones, you know, then then they'll save it. And so I believe that Captain Lucky showed up in a row of some other type of tomato. <laughs> the, the person who was growing them noticed that it was exceptional in flavor. And it's also a really good grower, too. He may have had to, to select it back for a few years. People can make their own open pollinated variety. I know a lot of vegetable growers who may have had one pet project, you know, one pet breeding project, something like this, either noticing a, di- a plant that's different than the others and saving it for a number of years, or just someone saying, like, I wish I had a lighter pink tomato, you know, in crossing... German Johnson or Brandywine, you know, a pink tomato with great white or something like that until they got the particular shade of, of pink they were looking for. Because it's, it's, it is, it's a lot of work to do a f- breeding full time and may t- take years before you get paid. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of breeder, or sorry, there's a lot of growers, just vegetable growers who will, you know, have kind of like, we call it a backyard breeding project, you know, ha- ha- be working on just like one variety. And so Captain Lucky, is is an example of this it's a more recent open pollinated variety because typically what we say is uh, is after hybridization right so let's say let's say i have my pink tomato project right and so i'm crossing say german johnson with great white to try to get a lighter pink tomato let's say i do that i'll cross i'll take the uh take the pollen from a great white introduce it to the ovary of a german johnson i take that tomato right because i labeled it I said, this is a cross of, of Great White and, and German Johnson. I let the tomato ripen because typically the, the seeds become viable once the, in, in tomatoes, the fruit is ripe. So I'll sa- I save those seeds and let's say I plant a hundred of them out the next year. And there, because, because it is a hybrid, there's, it's just kind of like human mm. children. You know how, how we have kids and they're not all the same. It's like some of them might take more after the mom. Some might take more after the dad. Same thing. You got tomato seeds. You got a, a hundred a hundred tomato plants that you've grown from this cross of German Johnson and Great White. And some of them are a little darker pink. Some of them are a little lighter. Maybe some of them look almost exactly like the dark pink German Johnson it came from. Maybe some of them look almost like the Great White. So I got a hundred plants out there. And maybe there's one that's like, oh, this one tastes good. And it looks exactly like the one that I wanted to. And so the, the, in, in order to develop new open pollinated ones, because I, I think also some people get the idea that OPs are only heritage varieties. I and mean, no, the, people are developing new open pollinated varieties all the time. Well, you know, typically what they say is that it takes about seven generations after a cross. So like, at, let's say I made my cross of Great White and German Johnson, and I, then I grew out the, the, the seeds from that tomato, and there's one that's perfect. It's exactly what I'm, I was looking for. Typically, the offspring for the next six generations would still show some variability. But after you've done this seven times, you take the fruit from that one where you're like, this is the tomato that I was going for. And then you, uh, because tomatoes are inbreeders, tend to be inbreeders, you know, maybe you do some isolation distance to make sure it doesn't get cross-pollinated by anything you didn't intend. But basically, you keep selecting 
the, the tomatoes from that one tomato for six more generations to give you a total of seven generations, usually that results in a stable a stable OP. So you can make new open pollinated varieties and people do it all the time. So Captain Lucky would be an example of that. And that act, that's actually brings me to a good point. That's a, another reason why a, a lot of seed companies are engaging in making hybrids is it's just faster, right? Because if you find if you find that right cross of a, a mother and a father variety that make a really good uh, progeny, a really good offspring variety, then all you have to do is do the productions with making those crosses, right? Whereas with open pollinated, you have six to seven breeding cycles before it, it's stable. Does this change the way you approach a seed catalog or what you're going to choose in the upcoming year? Yeah, a lot. You know, y'all went double clicked quite a bit uh, on that. So thank you for that because a lot of good stuff in there. Yes and no. I mean, I've been, you know, I've, I've learned some of this stuff, at least enough to, for me to survive. But I still remember, you know, when I first started. And so this is really how I would close this for kind of the newbies and maybe people who haven't who don't know this. But like I didn't know, like, why? Why would I in my filter selection when I'm going through my seed catalog online? You can, you know, say, oh, a greenhouse variety or this or that, uh, you know, uh, select, you know, this, this disease resistance or this disease resistance like you don't really know about these things. First off, you don't even know that there's a selection process. You just go by what a name that you know, you know, and then you start working through. And so you're the first time gardener. You're just going by, oh, my grandma planted brandy wine. I'm going to plant brandy wines. Well, then you're saying, well, I'm going to do this commercial. You realize brandy wines are probably not going to make you money because it's going to take you 100 plants to grow 10 plants worth of good, solid produce that you can market. And so you start learning these things, unfortunately, through time and, and money. So... It, when you can, when you know that these resources are out there and you understand this process that y'all are talking about, it really will speed up your time to market to get to where you are able to profit faster without having to make all these mistakes on just, oh, I want to, I want to grow this just because it's this. You know, I, I said this in one other podcast. One year I said, I'm just doing all heirlooms. It was my second year growing tomatoes. What a, you know, Nick didn't even stop me from that. I probably didn't consult you, but I was just like, no, you did not. what in the world was I doing? And I put them in the green. I was like, and they're not greenhouse. You know, it was just like, a worst year for us growing tomatoes learned a ton right but to know that you can go through and filter these things based on you know your climate so like when i go through my seed company that i purchase i'm looking for something that's heat tolerant i'm looking for something that's got uh, a lot of the diseases i fight with i'm looking for greenhouse performers i didn't know this though you know and then uh, you know some varieties i even realized you have to have a pollinator when i first started and i was putting these in a in a structure that didn't have allow insects in to pollinate and I wasn't doing anything. I'm like, and I could not get cucumbers and I was, it was straight eights actually, I think is what it was. If I remember right. And so I was just, you know, I've learned the hard way. So don't, don't learn the hard way, you know, pick up these magazines and, and do some studies on these and find the, the varieties you want. I've been accused of not being sentimental about anything, but like the, the example of, well, my grandma grew brandy wines. I don't think she researched brandy wines and chose that but it was probably the only tomato left right. at the hardware store the day she went to just haphazardly buy seeds mm -hmm. and now it's become this entrenched thing that a lot of people are betting the farm on that well my grandma was must have been right right and it was probably just the most random purchase i don't know grandma probably wasn't looking at you know texas a&m's trial research that right. showed leading yield by tomato you know, in a greenhouse setting, right? And so I, some of the, the takeaway is, you know, know your seed rep. Call them up. Yeah. Ask them for, for recommendations. You know, local universities yeah. have extension agents, so and they get paid to answer farming questions and give advice. And so there are resources to, to reach, reach out to and, and help steer you in the clear. Well, I think this is going to get ended by the city of Paris. The neighbor's fire alarm has been going off for the last 10 minutes, and now I hear the sirens coming. So thank you all for your time on this one, and that's a good reason to wrap up. Join us on the next episode where we're going to discuss, we're going to do a book report on the Greenhouse and Hoop House Grower's Handbook, wrote by our guest Andrew Medford, and we're going to get into hoop houses. We'll see you next time.